Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. All right, welcome to Long Range Pursuit. I'm Garrett Wall. Here with me, Landon Michaels, and our new product manager in the rifle space, Jim, Mr. Jim Sabir. Did I pronounce that quote correctly? Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, Jim. Yeah, uh, thank you. First time joining us on the podcast. Folks listening have probably been bored by Landon and I a time or two. Plenty of times. But uh, that's okay. We'll, uh, we're here today to talk kind of an exciting, smaller part of our business, but it's an exciting part of our business, and that is muzzleloaders. Uh, Landon hunts a bunch with the muzzleloader. I've been on a number of neat hunts. Some of my most you know, fond memories mm-hmm. out in the field have been with the muzzleloader. And Jim, in his role as product management, is uh, this is in his wheelhouse and shot a lot of muzzleloader in the past, right? But new to some of our Gunworks muzzleloaders. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, introduce yourself, Jim, and then we'll start talking some muzzleloaders. Yeah. Uh, great to be here. Jim Solbier, close enough what Garrett said. <laughs> uh, fun fact, I the first animal, big game animal I ever shot was with a muzzleloader. Right. And I, I hesitate to even tell you how many years ago that was, <laughs> Fine. Um, but I remember it fondly. You know, it was, yeah, great, great, uh, great memory, and and it was something. It was, um, you know, between the muzzleloader and the bow, I think, I think I shot more deer with a muzzleloader and a bow. I know I shot more with a muzzleloader and a bow um, over many years, sure. but certainly those early days before I ever picked a rifle up. Mm-hmm. And that was back east. Yeah. 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 You know, growing up in Utah, it was the same thing for me. I, I was a muzzleloader hunter. That's what I did every year. And I, I don't, honestly, I can't even tell you why or where that started. I think probably a lot of it was the lack of competition, sure. you know? I mean, I, I still vividly remember the first time I actually ran into another hunter in the field with a, with a muzzleloader. Now, that changed over the years a lot. But, you know, back then you had the mountains to yourself. Now it's probably season driven, uh, back East primarily. It is, right? Yeah. And so that, I think that's a big change for me mm-hmm. in, in my move out West. Um, you know, Montana has no muzzleloader season mm-hmm. to speak of. Mm-hmm. I mean, without really putting on full circus show to try and make yeah. it happen. Um, so yeah, n- not much West experience with the muzzleloader. Um, but back east, it was it was it had its own season. That early muzzleloader season, I, I recall vividly. It was it was like prime time, mm-hmm. like right before the rut. It's you know a three short day season, but man, you were there. Like yeah. that was a thing. Sure. And then we had our late muzzleloader season. That, you know we we would tag on to. So um, yeah, it was it was certainly important for me. You know, I didn't have to worry about other hunters. It yeah. was a dedicated season. We were on private land, but. Great, great, uh, great memories. And and watching over the years and looking back at technology, and I think it's really exciting as we jump in today to talk about the evolution of the muzzleloader. My mm-hmm. God, the primitive weapon that we were using, <laughs> truly primitive back then. And, and it was, you know, it was quite uh, challenging even getting it to go off at times. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. And to where we've gotten today. Lag, which we <laughs> Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah, that's a real thing. You know, Landon, uh you talk about Utah. Landon and I grew up in Utah and did a lot of our early hunting there. But if you remember, that muzzleloader season used to start on like a Wednesday. Yeah. And so yeah. you it was a Wednesday to Wednesday. Yeah. And you literally and nobody would hunt that Wednesday, Thursday yeah. So if you could do it and make it work, my dad would take me on a couple of those hunts and it would be did the dedicated hunter. And the, uh, there was one time I was with my brother and I'm like, should we check the reg? Are, are, are we sure it's actually it's not another it? truck? Yeah. And then in the rifle season in Utah, everybody knows that's they're different. Oh, yeah. So, so mm-hmm. pretty neat. Well, let's do this. We will try and not go down too many memory lanes. Yeah, sure. But let's talk a little why, and then let's get into the, we'll nerd out as to, as to why we're talking about this, some of the tech specs and just how neat this product is. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the, you know, why a muzzleloader. You guys, I'm going to jump in, and then you guys cut me off when I, when I spoke too much. But I think about the hunts we have drawn around here. With a muzzleloader. Was your was your Ibex rifle or muzzleloader? It was rifle. You were rifle, that's yeah. right. Now, I always figured if I ever drew it, it would be muzzleloader because yeah. that's the easier tag to draw. But, you know, I got lucky. You got lucky. Get rifle. So I think, you know, 
Craig pulled that, that muzzle loaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Florida. But we've, we've had a dozen tags down in New Mexico. We've done a lot of neat. In fact, my biggest deer to whitetail, which I hope people don't judge me on, but living out West is with a muzzleloader in Kansas. Yeah. And, uh, we drew that tag for a number of years. Think about Wyoming doesn't have a ton of muzzleloader hunts, but there's a neat, you know, yeah. neat handgun muzzle. Sure wish the state would, would, here's, here's my little shameless plug, would put some more yeah. opportunities for muzzleloader hunters in Wyoming specifically. Very limited. But. And I think about it, I'm not, I'm not the most gear driven individual that we have here. We have a lot of talented people. Landon's one of them just understands the gear and the product very well. I'm not, not that way, but I have been drawn to the seasons, the opportunity, the odds and, and couple of the states that we'll start talking about today, these changes, we say primitive weapon, but we were shooting these muzzle loaders. When Mike started shooting this thing, we're shooting five, 600 yards. I'll bet anybody steak dinner, Mike can hit that plate at a thousand yards, mm-hmm. the muzzle. Loader. I mean, he's, he's that good. A lot goes into it, but fast forward to New Mexico, removing the scope, Utah this year, removing mm-hmm. the scope. I mean, think about it. After they added it about seven years ago. Yeah. All yeah. three of us were at Salt Lake this year at the expo and how many people came in scratching their head about what, what am solution. I going to do? Yeah. So I think for the listeners, here's my plug. The muzzleloader, it's neat. It's, it, it's fun. It's a challenge, very different than rifle shooting, which we'll get into. But if you will look into this, your odds of drawing an awesome tag, dedicated season, trophy animal, having more of the mountain to your sin. Better dates oftentimes. Yep. Yep. Right. Dates, trophy quality. You will open up a ton of opportunity by looking at a muzzleloader. We use uh, WTA, Worldwide Trophy Adventures, that's the acronym WTA, for a lot of our tag applications. And sure, all of us can, we're all capable of logging in and applying someone. What you get in, in someone like that is is letting you know that, hey, New Mexico now, Unit 17, you, you can't run a 5.5 to 22 power scope. You have to run, you know, an open site or Utah this. And so, you know, keeping you track, if you're busy in life, that's a great opportunity to keep track of that. But those odds, it's exciting to talk to some of these outfitters about what is going to happen with, you take that scope off. Now you can shoot 400 pretty good. Now we're shooting to 250 yards. But if you'll get comfortable with that, man, some of those units are going to get really fun to hunt. Oh, yeah. In my, in my opinion. So having said that, let's uh, let's dive into the muzzle loader itself and uh, what what that entails. Jim, kick us off. Talk to be talk to us about about that. Yeah, um, I mean, when you look at the nuts and bolts of a muzzle loader and and how it's a little bit intimidating, right? You know, when especially for a a hunter that that has no understanding or experience with reloading, sure. and and you talk about um, taking gunpowder, in in this loose case powder. Uh, loose powder, in this case blackhorn. 209 powder and and pouring that right down the barrel right and then stuffing a bullet on top and with the ramrod and you know and and then having your ignition system that's totally separate that i've got to manage and understand it feels intimidating but it really isn't it doesn't have to be sure right and i think the the advice that i would give anybody is to to just look into it a little bit Lots of tutorials, lots of information out there. It take the mystery away, and it is really fun, right? You, the big cloud of smoke, the 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 allure of of the the boom. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think I think you know take that away and try and and dig in, and you'll quickly become uh, comfortable. You know the way I look at it is. You know, your modern centerfire rifle is almost plug and play, right? And we've even taken it to the next level where, you know, a thousand yards out of the box is, is our is our thing. Sure. Um, I look at muzzleloaders as just a little bit more hands on and you know, probably a lot of guys listening have shot archery or whatever else. If you're an if you're an archery hunter, I would dare say you have to be just a little bit of a technician, mm-hmm. right? You I mean you may not be out there fletching your own arrows and doing whatever else, but you still gotta pull out your Allen wrenches and side in a, a sight. You've gotta you know, figure out how to, to tie in a knock and, you know, just, just some, some things like that that are just a little bit more hands-on. I see that being kind of parallel to, to muzzleloading uh, versus just your, your traditional centerfire gun. Mm-hmm. 
But even then, we've taken a lot of steps to systematize and simplify that with a Gunworks muzzleloader. So yes, you're still weighing powder charges. You're still dumping loose powder down your barrel. You know, you're doing all these things. But again, we'll give you that load. You don't have to go figure out, am I going to shoot Pyrodex or uh, Black Powder or Blackhorn 209 or something else? I don't have to go figure out what bullet because we've got all that sorted out for you. So we'll provide provide all that data. And you're just being a, a little bit more, there's a little more finesse on loading and handling and cleaning a muzzleloader in necessary than just throwing around in the chamber and pulling the trigger. Yeah, I think about the kit. I'd made a couple notes about that. Like think about your kit that's in your top yeah. pack somewhere, yeah. which is a bullet starter and a charge tube and a funnel. Yeah. And a scale of some sort mm -hmm. that shoot through. Maybe you don't have the ability to load everything up back at camp. The cleaning, like you said, the cleaning regiment. Yeah. Blackhorn 209, you can push a little farther. I've seen guys shoot that. But after a dozen shots. You're still wanting to clean a lot more a lot more frequently than you are, than you are a centerfire gun. Yeah, anyway. But go ahead. Well, I, I your your analogy to the bow hunter, you know, we, we in that in that realm, in the archery world, you know, you think about a lot of folks in their paper tuning, mm -hmm. you know, they're doing a, a lot of their work themselves too. Right. Versus the guy that, that is able to have a, a great technician, right? Sure. And that great technician gets their bow dialed and then they shoot it and practice and they're ready. You know, that's the sort of thing that we've done here. Every single muzzleloader that comes off the line goes into the tunnel and shoots, mm -hmm. right? They're, they've got real velocity, the load... Everything is dialed, and so, you know, the mystery should be gone, right? It's paper tuned, it's, you know, however you want to call it. Sure. So we're we're actually helping to take some of the mystery out and and make that those early steps much easier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let me ask this: I by role, I deal a lot in the sales and have for a number of years, which I I really enjoy. You guys on the product side. Let, let's reverse that. So I call in or, or I'm interested. I, I hear your podcast and I'm, it piques my curiosity and I call into the main line. What are you, what questions should I be asking? What options do I have? Like guide me through selecting the right muzzle loader. So I think in a, in a sense, we're, we're introducing folks to the, the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Let's guide them into the gun that we think would, would make some sense. You know, this is honestly be probably a better question even for the sales guys because they they do this day in day yeah, out. Okay. But I think the first question I would ask a guy is is what are, what are you intending to do with it, yeah. right? And I generally that's probably the first question we ask anybody looking for a rifle. But you know, are you are you headed for fourth season elk in Colorado, or are you did you pull a Ponce gaunt, gaunt deer tag in Utah? Um, those are very very different things. Are you hunting? Midwest, you know, some of these uh, muzzler seasons in the Midwest and back East that I'm a little bit less familiar with, but, you know, it's typically more uh, season and opportunity driven than range, extend your range kind of, kind of thing. Right. Um, you know, and so, so, you know, I think the first choice is what caliber are you shooting? We, we generally would build a 45 cal and a 50 cal. Um, and personally, I gravitate towards the 45 on just about everything, but there are a few exceptions there. If you're going to go kill kind of an outside thing, but a moose or a bison or something like that, yeah, you probably want a big 50 cal. Um, I think Colorado requires a 50 cal for elk. That's the one That's probably the one. big That's thing it. that I think about yeah. uh, that is is a limiter. If, if elk in Colorado is on your menu, then you probably want a 50 cal. But just about anything else, I would push most guys to a 45 because it's less recoil. It's going to be a little bit better ballistics. Um and yeah, why why shoot a bigger bullet if you don't need to? Yeah, generally our mentality. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. And and you know, the forty five caliber is, um, it's a better mousetrap, right? You get better ballistics. You've got great bullet selection. Um, there's there's really outside of Colorado and having some regulation that requires it. I would absolutely push somebody to a forty five, right? Yeah, I, I mean. Um, you know, and for a long time, we shot Sabos in just about everything. We've kind of started moving towards these uh, power belts that are more of a bore rider type um, bullet. And there's a few advantages there. One, uh, I think you're gaining a little bit in BC, which, you know, for anything when you're trying to extend your range, it's going to be important. Mm -hmm. um, but that also opens up a few more 
uh, states for regulations. And I think that's one of the big things to understand when you're looking into hunting with a muzzleloader is every state is yeah. different. Yeah. Um, and there's, and it's, it gets a little bit complex. You know, I think if you build a list of states that are on your agenda, then that narrows it down. If, if, if a state's never, never going to be on your list and don't bother, don't muddy the waters there. Um, but you know, some of these states like Colorado, you can't shoot a Sabo. So you need a, a bullet that is actually touching the bore, um, of your, uh, of your barrel. So there's a few things definitely there to keep in mind. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that I don't know of any state that says you can't use a bore rider. Right. But there are, right. there are a exactly number of states right. that don't want you to yeah. use Sabos. Now there are some states that you can't even use a copper jacketed bullet. They have to be yeah. a solid co- uh, lead bullet. Right. You know, that's, those are starting to get into the very restricted, yeah. more primitive Correct. leaning. But, um, you know, Montana, some of their weird yeah. muzzleloader seasons are like that. Idaho is like that. Um, so there's a couple, couple of those kind of complicated uh, bits and pieces as well, as far as bullet choice is concerned. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree totally. So 45, I'm in the fifties, not a bad gun. The ballistics are still really good. Um, the, the recoil can be more, but you know, to pay the price for the recoil is not necessary. And, and, and yeah, ballistics are better on a 45. Yeah. So. And I and I would have been really impressed with um, the performance of the you know the arrow tip bullets and you, you know, know just I I've seen I've seen Jeremy come back I mean that guy can make any gun shoot mm-hmm. but I've seen him with some muzzleloader groups that wouldn't mm. put any centerfire rifle mm-hmm. to shame mm-hmm. like one whole groups with a muzzleloader at 100 yards <laughs> is, is pretty dang impressive yeah. you know um, you know I think your your real limitation is not precision or accuracy it's uh, really just, um, limitations in your sighting device, which, you know, we'll probably dive into that in a little bit more detail, <laughs> uh, or energy just downrange. You're, you're starting out with a lower BC, lower velocity generally than some of your Magnum centerfire cartridges. And so your bullets just not getting there as efficiently as some of our big sleek high BC centerfire yeah. rounds. But other than that, those, these muzzlers are absolutely capable. I think with those early turrets, we used to build on that um, this way just 10, 12 years ago, a couple of Mike's first projects. Roughly speaking, the, with a 20-minute scope, you used to get out to about a 1,000 yard yeah. turn yeah. on a center fire, you know, one of our seven mags. Um, on When he had marked turret for a muzzy, it was about 500 yards. His roots was 20 minutes, you know. The, uh, the wind uh, factor here when we get into, you know, we've really got the up and down, the drop dialed, the, the ballistics down, but the wind, the art of the wind. It's a big home. deal. You no, know, I've told this story a hundred times on video and podcasts, but my biggest heartache or heartbreak was in the field in New Mexico with Craig. And I was camera guy. He had a muzzleloader tag and we got in on the, you know, the biggest animal I'd ever chased on the hoof. And I'm trying to be cameraman and spot, which is tricky. It was 400 something yard shot. And and I just didn't give him the right wind call. And we, you know, we played it with the wind so that if he's, if I miss the wind call, we're missing the animal, right? It's okay. going to go off the front yeah. of his chest. And if I'm right, we're, it's going to be a Hollywood shot on the shoulder. Yeah. And none of this, get it in the guts tight. We're going to make a really good shot or we're going to, it's going to go off we the missed. front of his yeah. chest. And we missed off the front. And this was a massive mm-hmm. five point, like just to, really? just shakes you, you know, the mm-hmm. camera gets not, everything happens, all heck breaks loose. And I've, that's never left me. It was Dang. eight, nine years ago. But shooting this muzzle loader in the wind is a whole different animal. It is. Animal. It is. And, you know, there's there's a science and a, and a numbers element to wind, and there is an art, like yeah. you mentioned, yeah. to wind. And, um, you know, ultimately, it absolutely follows all the rules. You you mm-hmm. plug it into your, into your BR4 or your bino or your ballistic calculator, if you know the BC and the velocity and the distance and the in the direction and velocity of your wind, you've got a a dead nuts wind call. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, and a lot of times we, as you kind of start delving deeper into the long range shooting, there's an an art element or an intuitive element mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And my observation is just rough, but it's just about if just about double what you would expect with a centerfire rifle, and that's about what you're going to hold with the wind, with the muzzleloader is. Yeah. yeah, you know, Ransom had uh, that muzzleloader antelope tag a couple years back, and I remember him telling that story of, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 
plus mile per hour winds yeah. on a 400 yard shot in an antelope. And he was, he said it just was jarring to be holding his reticle on a doe standing like 10 yards to the side of the antelope that he was shooting at and center punching that, that antelope, you yeah. know, and it's, yeah, yeah. The, the, the wind moves those muzzleloader bullets pretty, yeah. pretty good. Big, big, big off. Um, okay. So I call in and we talk, you know, I identify some states, we talk some calibers. What are some other considerations? You know, the scopes, I'll ask the question that we don't dive too politically, but did New Mexico and Utah get it right in, in eliminating the opt? The start that. That, that I think that's that's a, a opinion thing, right? And everybody's going to have one, though. very strong opinions. You know, I, I, like I said, you know, this is my just kind of my little rant session. Is sure. I grew up hunting muzzleloader in Utah, and it was red dots or or yeah. no scopes for yeah. my entire life. And to think of the animals that I know I could have hilt, killed oh, if I just right. had like a three power. Scope. That's all I needed. Just, just, just to not, just something. to not cover that animal with, with the entire yeah. dot in your scope. The stuff I could have killed over the years with, with a, <laughs> with a scope. It just makes me sick. And of course, they, they, the year after I moved out of Utah, they, they brought in the scopes, and now just recently they, they, they took them away again. <laughs> and I, I like scopes on muzzleloaders, but I can certainly see the the reasoning behind moving them. I think there's been a lot of divisiveness on how it's been done, particularly in Utah. I won't go any farther than that. But um, yeah, I, I think it is what it is, and and we we have to manage our animals and our and our herds, and we have you know we as hunter has hunters have become very very efficient at killing stuff. Sure. And you think about it, twenty years ago, the number of animals that got killed on archery hunts in the western states was almost a drop in the bucket didn't even matter right i think in a lot of these units the the real real trophy animals are getting weeded out before muzzleloader and rifle seasons even start in recent years right so we have to find ways to to limit ourselves you know whether and that's either cutting back on tags or it's it's limiting ourselves and so we're not as good at killing stuff and you know that's the route a lot of state agencies are going and you know i can't really argue with that I, I look at it as as something entirely different. Yeah, it's, it's an opportunity to try something to be better. New, yeah, right. 100%. The the Revic Exosite, what a tremendous right. you know piece of uh, kit where you can put it on there and have uh, the same kind of you know dial and crank it up and and have my holdovers. Now the ability to see <laughs> and and use that peep to a certain degree it is it's absolutely going to limit your your range yeah but I, I think it's i think it's great you know and and maybe back on my soapbox but um there's a lot of guys out there particularly in the muzzleloader space where we get criticized for saying well you're just turning your muzzleloader into a center fire rifle and that's not muzzleloadering it's it's not the the spirit of a muzzleloader <laughs> season question. you know my argument is the, the rules are set in a specific way intentionally, and it's our job as hunters and as a business that builds products to make hunters successful to absolutely optimize and maximize that and to be the best at killing. And it's not just killing stuff, but it's being ethical and not wounding things. And, and you know, that, that's a whole debate in the muzzler space. But how can you argue with someone that's that's operating within the limits of the law, even if you're taking it to the limit of the law, um, you know, that's what the law is. And so I, I ha take issue with people that complain about that. Now, if the states want to limit, sure. change the rules, then great. I, I'm not going to argue with that. And we'll, we'll operate at those new limits, right? And so I, I think it's, it's just at, we, we, um, we elect officials to set, make those rules yeah. and we'll follow those rules exactly how they're how they're made, you know? Yeah. Anyway, just I'll step off my soapbox. I did a podcast with Austin. Craig and I did a couple of years ago yeah. on hunting, hunting fool. And he was on the committee that was making this decision at the time. This yeah. was before they came down with that. And he was asking us our thoughts on it. And that, you know, I'm, I'm flattered that some of the industry thinks we're responsible for <laughs> these high <laughs> harvest rates. Yeah. But I mean, just think about technology in general, like the Onyx maps and 
are we going to ever tell Zbrowski they can't, yeah. we, they've got to dial back the clarity of their optics or sure. Kuyu's got to slow down on having light, like the stuff that gets you farther into. Think about all the advancements that have made someone mm -hmm. like Lannan Michael successful in sure. the field. Sure. It's not just an optic. I can promise you, you can stay in the field longer. You can pre-scout more. Yeah. You can see more inches and better than you ever have when, right. you, when you're right. early on. And people are hunting harder too. Absolutely. People are just more serious about it. Absolutely. It, it, gone are the days where, you know, you throw on your flannel and, yep. and, and walk out and shoot, we shoot the first again. bike you see, right? It's like people are spending the entire season in the field and passing all these animals and scouting all summer long. It's, it's, it's just the game has changed. Yeah, 100%. Right? And you're right, Jim. I, I, I parlay that into that. Out comes a new piece of technology with this limitation, the XO Revic site, which is pretty cool. I can't, so, so it's an open site. This is going to be governed or dictated by your ability to see. Yeah, I sight. Absolutely. I wouldn't put up five people in a row and guarantee they're all going to shoot the same. I can shoot that out to, I had a Colorado deer tag two years ago, didn't, didn't tag out, but I practiced all summer. And 250 yards, fine, I'm in. 10 Pass feet further, at it. no, we got to shut it down. I 300 just, just wasn't going to happen. Now, Craig, we, we've shot on a number of times. Craig, out to 350, I'm in. I'll bet anybody a steak dinner, Craig, will hit that. I've, I've got a friend shooting deer silhouettes at 500 yards. Like, I've legitimately I've legitimately seen group after group after group. I won't name a name, yeah. um, but he has better than 20-20 vision. And so he's, yeah. I mean, he's just capable of doing it, and he's, and he's meticulous and perfected that art, but... I'm, I'm the same way. I'm about 250 on a deer elk. You know, you could probably stretch it 350, something like that. But past that, the contrast without any magnification is pretty tough. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the real kicker. If it's going to depend on circumstances, yeah, first light, last light, um, animal background, mm -hmm. like you know, yeah. in in certain scenarios, under ideal circumstances, you can stretch it further and. Then, in lesser circumstances, it could be a hundred, yeah. you know. So it, yeah, a lot, a lot that go into, you know, what that, what the capability range can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. So we'll mark the ballistics back to me as the buyer and you guys as the sellers. Mm -hmm. So get a turret on that open site and literally just dial. And now again, if for me, I'm just dialing a few clicks up to 250 yard, but it gives me all the confidence yeah. in the world with, with yeah. that drop. Hey, I mean, it really is absolutely, there's there's nothing out there like it as far as yeah. turning, putting a, a non-magnified, um, non-optical sight on a muzzleloader. I, I've not seen anything. And unlike right? the optic world where you want to go look for a hunting rifle scope and you Google that and you'll never find the end of it, Right. this, uh, options are pretty slim, right? Yeah. You're going to find quickly that there's not. Exactly right. right. Especially with that amount of precision control in it with with running a ballistic profile and drops rather than just a, you know, a, a kind of guesswork, you know, I'm getting a 24 inch yeah. drop at 150 yards, so I'm going to hold top of fur kind of thing, right? This is legitimate ballistics, you're dialing minutes or, or BDC, uh, a turret much like on a, on a traditional scope. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... Let's talk a little bit about going, kind of jump back to kid in a little bit, the, the ignition system. If somebody's on this podcast and they're, or they go start to shop for muzzleloaders after this, they're going to find, let's talk about our ignition system, mm -hmm. why we're doing it, and, and maybe what else folks are, are seeing out there. Yeah, so we're using the Remington Ultimate uh, muzzleloader system. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've seen that system, it's using a, a brass case that looks like a pistol cartridge yeah. with, a, with a primer in it. Um, and you're putting, uh, that essentially slides over a cone on the rear of your breech plug. Mm -hmm. um, you know, y y I mean, you remember years back, we were using those little mini actions with a, with a shotgun primer. Worked great. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, what has probably been four years that we yep. moved to this system now, um, we're able to use a, 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 a bolt action receiver, just like you'd build on a 6.5 Creedmoor or something else. Yep. Um, and it's essentially um, a, a unique barrel that we're threading that breech plug into. And so it's nice because I think, I mean, you have a lot more history here, Garrett, but, but producing that specialized muzzleloader action in volumes that we needed in ways that we could reliably build them and have them available for, available for customers was kind of tough, right? Yeah. You're only building a few here and there. Yeah. 
Um, now when we can, we can build uh, 200 actions in a month and use any of those actions for a rifle build or a muzzleloader build, it mm -hmm. makes it a lot more efficient to be able to yeah. Great on the supply. Thing. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think to add to that, if 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 you look back in the days of you know, two oh nine, Josh, even prior to that, some of the ignition musket caps and percussion yeah. caps, and you know the things that we used to use, two oh nine shot shell primers do a great job. Yeah, right. They they the downside to them is managing and holding and loading and un, un and unloading. Um, this new system uses a large rifle magnum primer, yeah. so the the ignition a good source is of spark. There it, it is, yeah. and you get you get uh, really good velocities, uh, consistent. You know our extreme spreads are really low, and you know we get good ignition. So yeah. we're getting good ignition, good burn, and because of the way we're using a regular, you know, action and putting that shell in there over top that cone. You're really keeping you're sealing that. it off. You're sealing it off. You're keeping it protected, and you're not going to have the hang fires of days. Yeah, yeah. You're not worried about by. not worrying worried about a rainy day and getting it's, water. It's going to go back in there, right? Yeah. You know the other thing. It's it's kind of nuanced, but even loading the dang thing. If anybody that's ever tried to load like a little number eleven cap onto a oh, nipple when, the, when it's cold there. and you got gloves <laughs> on, you drop you know, three for every exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that, that big case is really nice to load. It extracts just yeah. like a, a case, a rifle case does. It sure does. Right? So there's some really nice, nice advantages to using that system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Easy. Easy to use. Get, yeah. you know, and, you know, it works well. So I think, you know, that, that along with, you know, so ignition, great topic. And I think that, you know, the, the advances made there have been really helpful. The next one is, is gosh, bullets. Look at the look at the technology mm -hmm. and the the increases in in performance of bullets where you're getting good quality projectiles with high BCs and to do that we we also increase our twist rate mm -hmm. you know you think about what the twist rate used to be on or was on muzzle loaders back when and we're using one and twenty inch fast twists to help stabilize these long yeah. high BC bullets. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely what's contributing to the the accuracy potential of those those guns. You know, we're using cut rifled barrels, which I doubt you there's many people building cut rifled muzzleloaders. You know, these days, I mean, it's it's we build it just like we build a build a rifle. Uh, you know, we're putting brakes on those barrels, which you know it, you're starting to see that become a little bit more of a thing, but it was not a thing for mm -hmm. a long time. Well, you know, you put you put 95 or 100 grains of Blackhorn 209 in those muzzleloaders with a Three, what 327 grain yeah. bullet. There's there's some hefty recoil there, Knock. and that break makes a makes a big difference. Big difference. Big. You know, I've always loved the recoil on a muzzleloader is so different than a centerfire rifle. <laughs> I just I I don't know. It's maybe nostalgic, but yeah. How would you maybe I would compare it to like shooting a rifle with a suppressor? It's yeah. more of a push. push than a than a kick, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, that's just kind of. Yeah. Those, yeah, think about the the smoke. You know, and mm -hmm. there you don't get to call your impact on them. Yeah, unless there's a stiff breeze and the sure, you know, sure. The smoke goes with it. But no, that's pretty special. Uh, you know, the muzzleloader. I like to talk about just a couple things. The muzzleloader. Uh, well, encouraging everybody to take a peek at it. Like you said, it. You got to take it serious. The loading. You'll load it wrong the first time. I remember we had a very good customer. I won't name his name, but gets a muzzleloader. Going on a very big hunt. Calls me. Says Garrett. It was on a Saturday. I remember Saturday morning. He's like, I just skipped this bullet into the target. You know, and we sh I knew that this gun was, was perfect. I said, you know, you did 95 of this, and we load that, and he tries it again and skips it into the target, and that yeah. dawned on me that he's going by volume. You know, he's looking oh. at his charged, yeah. you know, in instead of by weight. Yeah. And so you'll... That's a nuanced difference, right? Yeah. Yes, very quickly. And uh, different languages, I think a lot of people, when I started, I used to just grab that. That's, yeah. how, that's how we always did it. You just skimmed it off the top. Mine was brass. It yeah. The little yeah. skimmer funnel thing built in. Yeah. yeah. No, great, great point. And and even to touch on to the barrels, right? It's not just that we're using cut rifled barrels. And I think it's a really important thing to be aware of is muzzle loaders traditionally have not been built with the same quality right. barrel steel we use, yeah. you know, Heat-treated, proof, you know, barrel blanks, similar to what 
you would use for any of these high intensity cartridges. That's not the way muzzle loaders have historically been made, mm. right? And so, you know, that allows us the same precision, but also the strength, right? And so, you know, we we talk about grains versus volume. You know, there are, I think, the really important thing that people need to be aware of, and I, I in one phrase I tell you, or when I tell you not to be intimidated, in the next one, I want you to be absolutely aware of some key critical safety things that not not it's not about skipping off into the target it's about you know creating overpressure or you know any any circumstance where you hear of a catastrophic failure of a muzzleloader you know it's barrel obstruction double charge double load yeah okay and the difference there is a double charge has twice as much powder but one projectile those can still push out. If you, unco- <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's definitely not encouraged, not and you're 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 going to remember it. The double double load. Yeah, that. Okay, if you leave your gun loaded, and then you get in the heat of the moment, you're going out and you load on top of a load. That gun almost certainly is going to rupture. Yeah. Right. The 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 precautions that you need to take around your loading and your 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 sequence and and being very regimented about here's my cleaning rod my or my ramrod has a mark on it yeah. i know this is loaded or empty based on how far my ramrod goes down in that barrel yeah some of those precautions i think are really critical yeah had that happen through right around covid southern utah family hunt you know we got the crew and we're passing around muzzle loaders and a bunch of tags and brother-in-law gets one tipped over and my brother wants to take the nephew over where they'd seen another one. So we send the gun over and they load it and it had been loaded. You know, luckily, like you say, precautions, we've got the, as he was loading that second one, he saw the ramrod and said, Hey, wait a minute. So a respect for these things is, and respect for any firearm, obviously very important, but these muzzle loaders, if you put your guard down for a second, we'll, we'll, we'll get, um, we'll burn you for sure. Yep. That's a good point, Jim. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so I feel like as the buyer, I understand, you know, the caliber selection optic. What what states still have? You, Arizona, you can still run an I think optic. Arizona, you can still run an optic. There's a couple um, ones here that we have. We can yeah, still yeah. Them. Wyoming hasn't shut us down. We just don't have many opportunities yeah. is, is the only thing there. Uh, Utah shut us down just recently. Uh, Colorado's shut down. Um, I think Washington, Oregon, uh, you know, Idaho is already pretty restrictive. Uh, they're very limiting on the on the type of muzzleloader. Mm-hmm. Uh, so generally, our ignition system is, is just kind of a no go uh, there. Uh, so we're definitely losing some opportunities as far as an optic is concerned. Kansas still has that pretty cool. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, that's right. Arizona's probably still got some neat opportunity. Yeah. But yeah, this EXO thing is going to or any open site or one. But you know, it's it's really nice. You call in an order, and just depending on which state you're in, um, we'll either set you up with a with a scope and an yeah. XO, right? That's yeah. really easy. You it, they they both mount on a Picatinny rail. You undo a couple screws, sl- slap on the new one, and you're ready to rock and roll. Um, uh, or you can configure it specifically with an XO site or specifically with a scope, just depending on what what you need. And so, pretty easy that way. Uh, Jim, any model considerations <laughs> from yeah? I'm well, you know, tr- yeah, I was gonna say historically you'd have had the choice of one model. You can get, you know, your MZ8 or your MZ8. Yeah, you know, and yeah, you know, really excited that we're bringing forward an MZ5. Okay, um, it it will utilize uh, all steel barrel. You know, we have a carbon wrap option and titanium action on our MZ8, and our MZ5 will come with a stainless action and uh, a stainless barrel. Um, you know, I would, I would call it a high value proposition product. So pretty excited that, that we, that we're going to offer that and hopefully get more, um, people involved in the muzzle loading, uh, efforts. Yeah. I hear, you know, in, in thinking about talking with customers on the phone and, and historically what the muzzle loader hunt has represented is you're going to do it once or twice or occasionally. So do I invest the kind of money? Mm you know, in a product like that. You get a titanium action on a carbon barrel and a three thousand dollar scope on it. These things are more as expensive or as more than our than our center fire rifle. Yeah. And I understand the the question from the buyer was, well, 
doesn't make sense if I'm running a hunt with it. You see a lot of them yeah. gravitating towards their outfit or do you have a gun I can borrow just, just for this one hunt? I think that's going to flip now with this. Now there's so many more states with more opportunity. You mm. can see guys doing it a little more. Yeah. Um, but the, the price point on this MZ5 product yeah. is, is going to open the door. Again, not a lot of, not a lot of options to choose from, a yeah. little, little basic. But from a, a utility or a tool, this thing is going to be every bit as capable at, mm -hmm. at smashing something at a distance. Yeah, if you, don't, you don't have to have the titanium in action and a carbon wrap barrel, which I will say the carbon wrap barrel that we've been doing for the last maybe two years is is awesome. Yeah, sure. I mean, the way that gun balances with a carbon barrel is, is yeah. beautiful. But yeah, I mean, if, if, if you don't need those things right now, you can justify, a, yeah. a, it's a lot easier to justify getting into a, uh, muzzleloader system and yeah, a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, so I would say don't be intimidated by the price. Depending on how it gets tricked out, it's it's going to be a it's going to probably have a six in it versus north of ten. Yeah. You know when yeah. that when that happens, and so uh, the the nice thing about uh, no scopes in some of these states is you're saving a couple thousand bucks on an optic at least. There you go, right? Yeah, yeah. loves it there. Yeah, yeah. I I actually want to you know encourage folks outside of maybe our traditional Western audience if you look at ballistics and and I, you know you if you run the numbers the ballistics on a 45 caliber muzzleloader are so much better than any of the straight wall options so straight wall case right huge push in a lot of places around straight wall to um i guess replace shotguns which are gosh terrible <laughs> um so so Looking at the muzzle loader and and realistically having one good shot, extending your range, mm -hmm. you know, and having a tool that you can use in in a lot of hunting opportunities. Probably doubling, don't you think? In a lot of cases, you're gosh, doubling. it's I would say so. Compare it to the 350 Legend, which is probably the the popular straight wall case right now. Mm -hmm. It's it's certainly double the the distance where you would have um, effective energy, right? So. With with a forty five caliber and you throw optics in because there's no restrictions in any of those locations right. around optics, now you've got five six hundred yards. Wow, you're realistic, right? Yeah. So I, I thought that was yeah, a totally great performance out. Yeah, the range. It's yeah, awesome. yeah. And the numbers, I mean, they don't lie. If you look at, you know, drop, um, and I wrote down, you know, for a three fifty legend, you're looking at twenty seven inches at three hundred yards mm -hmm. drop. And when compared to uh, 45, um, nineteen inches, so significant mm. in terms of performance at distance. So really, I, I think that that's something for folks to consider. You know, if you're gonna, you want to go to that Midwest and chase big whitetails, that's that's another great tool. Yeah, hundred <clears throat> percent. Well, I think the the theme here and the part of the purpose of this podcast was to bring some awareness to the opportunity that exists. It's it's not a product you'd want to buy on the shelf and try and run out and do tomorrow. Sure. You start in the fall getting ready for next fall, looking at the application seasons, getting all those in in January, February, you draw in April and May, and you're ready to practice all summer. We This year, we don't have a long-range university Muzzle loader specific course on the books. Scheduling just just didn't work this year. I really like to see with some luck we'll have that back for next year. Awesome opportunity if you want if you're new to it, come out and just yeah. learn that way. You don't have to buy the gun. Come out and shoot ours and see what you think about it. But get some practice. Number of training opportunities out there. Get some. Get a bunch of practice. Again, unlike the center fire, you'll you'll want to put a hundred rounds down range in the summer to get ready mm -hmm. for for an awesome hunt. But if you'll do that, like I said, my fondest memories, mountain to ourselves, <laughs> you know, more animals. And that, yeah. that's the one I'm trying to think about. Uh, parting thoughts. I think as the buyer here today, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty clear on what options and why I would do something like this. Any parting thoughts for you guys, for the, for the audience? Man, I think it's, it's like you said, it's opportunity and a uh, chance to get out there, uh, draw a tag. Just don't go, don't draw my tag. <laughs> <laughs> 
Fair you know, it's it's a, a draw season. Uh, results are re- results are hitting, or or most of them have hit. It yeah. feels like it's about nine o'clock on Christmas morning, and you didn't quite get what you <laughs> what you wanted. But you know, it's still got Wyoming. Well, still got Wyoming. Pull that yeah. awesome yeah. elk tag you're after. Yeah. But we'll see. <laughs> well, Jim, how about you? Yeah, I, I mean, I I just I love it. I think any 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 excuse to have a new opportunity to learn something new. I'm a, I'm a mm-hmm. gearhead, so this really works for me. Yeah, you know, I I love um, the experience, and and I don't know that I've ever been around anybody that shot that muzzleloader and didn't giggle. Yeah, yeah, 100%. right. You didn't have that like, yeah. oh, that was fun. Yeah, right. And it's different. Yeah, it really is. I don't know why that. Maybe it's maybe it's just because that was something that I went way back to. Yeah, but yeah, I really enjoy them. I I get excited to shoot them. I I know Landon and I went out and we were testing. You know, a one X option. You know, we're looking at, at, you know, for Utah, and mm-hmm. man, we had fun. You we, were, we, that was we, that we, was your first week on the job, I think, and I think we went out and literally just walked that gun right out to four hundred, four hundred yards yeah. you know, with a, with a red dot. With a red, I dot. think Jim the, Jim's head was just exploding, like couldn't even comprehend it. He's pretty cool. Sounds awesome. Yeah, definitely the limited optics. Uh, it's you can still shoot well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you put in the time. You'll, uh, this will turn into, uh, your go-to, I believe, in, in a lot of places, but well, if there's nothing else for the audience, I think we're going to wrap up there. I'm going to encourage everybody. If you're interested in some of these muzzleloader topics, you know, jump on gunworks.com, check out the MZ8 page and soon to be MZ5 page that you heard first here from Jim and, uh, dig a little more, give ourselves guys a call. A lot of them shoot muzzleloader, very knowledgeable. Um, we can walk you through, if you got your own muzzleloader and you want to talk about you know, some of the options out there. Um, love to chat with anybody about this topic. So we appreciate you listening today and look forward to having you next time. Thank you. If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.